Welcome to the worship service of Big Springs Community Church, and uh, we are glad and we rejoice that uh, we are here together, a gathering for worship this morning as God's people. <clears throat> uh, there are a few announcements. Uh, one of them is uh, added to my uh, bulletin. Uh, tomorrow is uh, Bill Bean's uh, birthday, so we, we greet him a happy birthday. Also, uh, if you have not heard, Kathy's mother, Marge, uh, passed away last Wednesday, uh, and um, they announced a memorial service on September 17th at the Wairika Methodist Church in, on uh, September 17th at noon. September 17th, yeah, and that's a Saturday. Um, also, uh, we have the new uh, Psalter hymnal since uh, the end, the last Sunday of August. I mean, uh, devotional, not Psalter hymnal. Uh, Nearer to God, it's all, they're all on the back uh, table there. So each one of you can uh, get a copy of it for your daily devotionals. <clears throat> All right, there's uh, one other praise item. Um, uh, Pastor Dilliman, uh, Adrian Dilliman from Visalia, uh, messaged everyone, uh, emailed everyone that the MRI and CAT scan results for Ruth, his wife, uh, revealed no new spots, and all the other um, spots remain the same. So that, that is uh, very good news for uh, our sister Ruth. Okay, let us now stand for our call to worship. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us with his words. To the saints who are in Ephesus and in Big Springs Community Church and are faithful to Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our dear Heavenly Father, rich in mercy, splendid in grace, wisdom, and justice, go before you. Peace and righteousness are at your right hand. Yet you alone are God, and you alone we worship. Pour out upon us your Holy Spirit, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth acceptable and pleasing to you, that we might know you in our hearts. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who together with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing our song of praise, Come Thou Almighty King. Oh. 
Today we will read uh, God's law uh, from Ephesians 4. And instead of verses 1 to 6, uh, I will read from Ephesians uh, 4, uh, 17 to 32. <clears throat> Uh, 25 to 32, I mean. So Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, this is God's law and will for our lives. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, these are uh, a lot of uh, things uh, that we have to remember as uh, we relate to one another in uh, Christ and also as we uh, relate to all other uh, people around us. So these are words that are uh, kind of hard for us to remember and obey all our lives. And so we are called by God to acknowledge, confess, and repent of our sins. So let us pray. Lord God, eternal and almighty Father, we acknowledge before your holy majesty, that we are poor sinners and conceived and born in guilt and in corruption. So because of our sin, we endlessly violate your holy commandments. Uh, we uh, do not love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength uh, at all times. And we also do not love our neighbor as ourselves at all times. But, O oh Lord, with heartfelt sorrow, we repent and turn away from all our offenses. Have compassion on us, most gracious God, Father of mercies, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And God promises to us that if we heartfully confess our sins, repent of them, he is faithful and just to confess. Um, to forgive us of all our sins. And in Ephesians 2, we read these words, But now in Christ Jesus, who you who were for once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. And so in, when we were unbelievers, we were far off from God. But because of a faith in Christ who saved us, from our sins, by his blood, uh, we have now peace with God. We have been reconciled with God. <clears throat> so let us uh, come to God in our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God in heaven, you uh, who created the world through your son Jesus Christ, in your wisdom, you knitted all of us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we only have a glimpse of the wonder and beauty of the unseen creatures under the sea and the immeasurable galaxies of the universe. Uh, we see uh, your creation this morning and all the days of our lives. Uh, we now see glimpses of the coming, at uh, the end of summer and the coming fall with uh, um, cooler mornings and, and even cooler days that we have recently. But we also pray that uh, you give us rain. And uh, we see that in your creation, in your sovereignty, uh, we have night and day. 
we have rain and snow, we have a wind, uh, we have sun and moon and stars, all the days of our lives, and you are sovereign over all these things until uh, you return from heaven uh, at the end of days. By your grace and mercy, then, you have invited us to make our requests known to you. So we first intercede on behalf of our civil authorities. So give wisdom to all of them, uh, whether it is federal, state, or local, so that they may govern according to your will and word, even though many of them are not believers in you. But you have given them um, conscience. You have uh, put your law into their hearts. And so they know what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. Our sovereign king, our nation is uh, deeply divided so that um, we are praying that uh, among all the many people's languages and cultures that, you, uh, that have uh, come to our nation, that we may have unity in diversity and lead us to uh, thankfulness and unity in our purposes. We pray for the Christian uh, ministry and mission of our church here in Big Springs and around the world. Uh, bless the reading and preaching of your word in all your churches that it may not return void without accomplishing all that you ordain for it. Make us holy even as you are holy. So we pray also not only for increase in spiritual maturity and knowledge, but also for increase in our numbers through the preaching of your word and our worship according to your word alone. Finally, we pray for the afflicted, for those who are sick, uh, uh, sick that they may be healed, for those who mourn, that they may be comforted, for those who are weary and heavy laden, that they might find rest, for those who are discouraged or depressed, that they might find the joy that is inexpressible and full of glory, for those who are anxious, that they might know the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray today especially for Kathy as uh, she grieves over the loss of her mother. Uh, we pray also, uh, we have uh, praise uh, to you. We offer our praise to you uh, for Ruth Dilliman as uh, she is uh, doing well uh, under her uh, treatments. Uh, we also continue to pray for Earl and Leo and Cecilia and Anita. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we will read a portion of our Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, we will read questions and answers 96 to 98. And this is about our true worship of God. So I will read the questions and we will read the answers together. Question 95. Question 96. What is God's will for us in the second commandment? Answer. That we in no way make any image of God nor worship Him in any other way than has been commanded in God's word. Question 97. May we then not make any image at all? Answer. God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Although creatures may be portrayed, yet God forbids making or having such images in order to worship them or serve God through them. Question 98. 
but may not images as books for the unlearned be permitted in churches? Answer. No, we should not try to be wiser than God. He wants a Christian community constructed by the living preaching of His Word, not by idols that cannot be taught. Our offerings today will be for the general fund. From 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 2, we read this exhortation. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And so this is uh, Paul's instructions to the church in Corinth uh, to give, to offer uh, for the relief of the uh, brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who are experiencing famine. So whenever they met uh, on the first day of the week, they had, uh, they made offerings. Our scripture readings uh, will come from uh, first uh, several verses from uh, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 15, and I, I will read uh, just um, several verses, not not the whole um, not the whole chapter. The word of the Lord from. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And then verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amal Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. And then verse uh, 10, The word of the Lord came to Saul, at Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, but he has turned uh, for his turn back from following me and has not performed my commandments. 
and Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was Saul, Samuel. Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? And Saul, Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. And then verse 19. Um, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took off the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and pres presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And then um, verse uh, 27, And Sam, as Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of God of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have a regret. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. And then uh, verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And then uh, we go to one verse in uh, the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12, verse 33. Um, and uh, here uh, we read uh, Jesus' words. And to love him, to love God with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as one's self is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And actually this is the words of uh, the scribes who asked Jesus what is the greatest commandment. Again I read, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as 
oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. O Lord, in your grace and mercy, you have made covenant promises to your undeserving, sinning people. Speak to us through your law and give us a sense of order and direction. Speak to us through your gospel that we might be transformed by your grace and renewed in hope. Amen. So dear people of God, was King Saul saved? This is one of the most frequently asked questions by Christians. The same question is also asked of King Solomon and a few other people in the scriptures. Many people point out that God bestowed the Holy Spirit on King Saul when he sought to kill David. However, this gift of the Spirit on Saul was God's means to prevent Saul from killing David. Remember the pagan prophet Balaam, who was sent by Balak, the king of Moab, to curse Israel. But the Spirit of God overpowered Balaam, so instead of cursing Israel, he pronounced blessings upon Israel. Therefore, it is not always true that a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is a believer. Many false teachers and prophets can be used by God to fulfill his purpose for his people. Also, we find that in all of King Saul's reign, he exhibited no true faith in God. He sought to kill David, God's anointed king, almost all his reign because he was jealous of David, whom the Israelites loved. After David struck Goliath dead and routed the Philistine army, the people sang this song. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And from that day on until his death, Saul persecuted David, especially after David won many battles. And so uh, we read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, so Saul was David's enemy continually. And, when, and then when he was defeated in his final battle, Saul committed suicide. And we read in 1 Chronicles 10, uh, a sad and a tragic ep epilogue of his life. It says, So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord, in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So that was the, the sad epilogue of his life. So was Saul saved? The sad answer is no. But his reign was full of promise and potential at the beginning. His son Jonathan defeated the Philistines and he led Israel's uh, uh, victory over uh, the Moabites, Edomites, and Ammonites. But there were two battles which became Saul's downfall. So the first was in, uh, previously in Sam, uh, 1 Samuel 13, when the mighty Philistine army was arrayed against Israel's army. And so the Israelites were said to be in trouble, hard-pressed. They were scattering in fear. And so Saul could not wait for Samuel for seven days to offer sacrifices before the battle in order to receive God's approval and blessing. So Saul then offered the sacrifices himself, violating God's law that only the priest, Samuel, could offer sacrifices. He usurped the duties of the priests. 
he couldn't wait for the Lord's will about the battle. And therefore, in that chapter, 1 Samuel 13, Samuel pronounced God's judgment against Saul, saying that the Lord has taken his kingdom away from him. This meant that his kingdom would end when he and his son Jonathan and his other two sons die in battle. So in our text this morning, uh, we read about a second battle which resulted in the Lord again pronouncing the end of Saul's kingdom or dynasty. He again disobeyed God's commandments. And so our theme this morning is God's warning against Israel. King Saul to obey is better than sacrifice under three headings. And uh, we have the three headings in our sermon notes. So first, Saul had a false alibi. He said the people spared the best to sacrifice to the Lord. So after Samuel pronounced the first rejection of Saul by God in chapter 13, Samuel again came to Saul with God's commandment. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. (coughs) (coughs) Why would God command innocent men, women, children, infants, and animals to be annihilated. Many liberals have condemned our God for this genocide. However, this war was prophesied by God about 400 years before the reign of King Saul. A people called the Amalekites attacked the Israelites led by Moses while they were traveling to the promised land. (coughs) Sorry. Um, They attacked God's people when they were faint and weary, killing those who were straggling behind. Deuteronomy 25. But God's people, led by Joshua, defeated the Amalekites. And after this battle, God declared to Moses in Exodus 17, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Amalekites also did not fear God. And this is a picture of God's final wrathful judgment against all unrepentant people on the last day. There are no such thing as an innocent human being, because all are sinners under God's wrath. Attacking God's people invokes God's curse. When God made a covenant with Abraham, centuries before Moses, God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. In the Old Testament, God's people, uh, God's covenant people, are the Israelites. In the New Testament, God's covenant people are all who believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, alone as Savior, namely, all true Christians, whether Jews or non-Jews, Gentiles. God's blessing and curse in Genesis 12.3 still applies Those who persecute, mock, harass, murder Christians are under God's curse and will reap what they sow. We have seen how they hate and do violence against churches and crisis pregnancy centers. How they plot to destroy families and children and our whole nation with their woke agenda. But one day, One day, God's patience will run out and they will walk to God's wrathful judgment. 
However, Saul and his men disobeyed God's command. They spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, oxen, calves, and lambs. So when Samuel confronted Saul about his disobedience, Saul had an alibi. The people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Saul reasoned to Samuel that he had done everything God had commanded him, but he spared the king and the best animals supposedly for thanksgiving sacrifices. There are three errors from his alibi. First, he actually did not do everything precisely as God commanded him. Second, he did not acknowledge his sin, blaming the people. Third, his spin on the animals is that they were offering uh, for offering thanksgiving and sacrifices. Uh, this is questionable at best since most victorious armies usually want to take spoils for themselves. After sacrificing animals, of course, they would feast on roast beef and lamb to satisfy their hunger after a great battle. Samuel then condemned Saul, saying, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Sacrifices are an ex an acceptable to God when the worshiper's heart is not right with God. Obedience is more important to God than going through the motions of worship as mere rituals. Yes. Our worship must be acceptable and pleasing to God. However, to be acceptable and pleasing to God, our hearts must also be acceptable and pleasing to God with true faith and righteous living. This is why the Apostle Paul exhorts us in Romans 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And as we come to worship, we must worship with both reverence and joy, as the psalmist does in Psalm 96, 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Worship with both holy splendor and trembling hearts. Because of his violation of God's commandment, Saul came under God's condemnation for a second time. God will take his kingdom away from him and give it to another whom he had chosen. Secondly, Saul had a false confession. I have sinned, but not against the Lord. So after Saul condemned uh, after Samuel condemned Saul and told him that his throne will be given to another, Saul made a confession of his sin. He said, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Again, there are three things that are lacking in Saul's confession. First, he confessed that he had sinned. But sinned against whom? His confession is very different from David's confession in Psalm 51 that we have sung. After David committed adultery and murder, he said in verse 4, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David acknowledged that first and foremost sin is a sin against God. And uh, only secondarily sin against another person. So when we sin, 
against another, we sin against God. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that the first and greatest commandment is loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if we do not love God wholeheartedly, we will never love our neighbor as ourselves. And then we sin against them. And this is why Saul did not love David, who had served him faithfully for years in leading Saul's armies to many victories. He did not love God truly, so he had no capacity to love his neighbor as he loved himself. Second, as in his alibi, he did the blame game again. He blamed his people for his sin, fearing them and obeying them, even if he knew that they were violating God's command. From the very beginning, man has played the blame game. After he sinned, Adam blamed his wife Eve, and then Eve blamed the serpent for her sin. Both did not acknowledge their sin against God, thinking that they could hide away from God. So we always put a spin on our violations of God's law, thinking that we can get away with murder. But God knows all our hearts, our words, and our works. On Judgment Day, all the sins of all unrepentant unbelievers will be exposed and condemned just as Saul was condemned. The third error in his plea for pardon was his pardon, plea for pardon was misdirected towards Samuel. Again, compare it with David's confession in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. David's plea for mercy was directed towards God alone. In contrast, Saul asked Samuel to please pardon me. His plea for pardon was directed towards Samuel alone, not towards God. Finally, the third thing is that Samuel's soul had uh, performed false, uh, false worship, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So after he asks for pardon, Saul asks Samuel to return with him, that I may bow before the Lord. Saul was concerned about saving face, not wanting his people to know that God had already rejected him and his throne will be taken away from him. Did Saul really want to worship God? The answer again, sadly, is no. He merely wanted to pretend to be a worshiper, to save face before his people. Three times he told Samuel, and he referred to the, law, uh, the God of Samuel, the Lord your God. Verses 15, 21, and 30. With his words, he was not acknowledging that the Lord of Samuel and of Israel is also his Lord and God. But in the end, Saul did bow before the Lord, but only for show. He did not truly repent of his sin. He did not truly confess of his sin and he did not truly worship God. In Revelation 11, the two witnesses of God who represented the church were martyred by the inhabitants of the earth. But after three days, God took them to heaven, and at that same hour, there was a great earthquake, and many died. But those who remained alive, it says, were terrified and 
gave glory to the God of heaven. Revelation eleven thirteen. So were this were this people who will be left behind on earth after all the believers are taken to heaven, like in the so-called rapture, when after all the believers are taken to heaven, do, do they also believe in God? No. In their terror of judgment day, they will acknowledge that God is almighty and glorious and sovereign over all. They will not have a second chance. This is false worship because they, like Saul, did not truly confess and repent of their sins and believe in God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for their salvation. So not all, therefore, who bow before God are true worshipers. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in Mark 12, a Jewish scribe asked Jesus what the greatest commandment is. And Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second greatest commandment is, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe added that these two commandments are much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 33. Jesus also affirmed in Matthew 9, 13, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Samuel wanted Saul to confess and repent of his sin before God, and then he could offer acceptable worship before God. The scribes and the Pharisees had mere external religion. Their offerings and sacrifices meant nothing to God because their hearts were far away from Him. They did not love their neighbors and their own, uh, as their own selves, being self-righteous and condemning. They rebuked Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners, the outcasts of the community. They had no mercy and love for others. And so Jesus rebuked them, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Therefore, when we come to worship and confess our sins, let us do it with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and welcome all who come and worship God with us. Then our worship will be pleasing and acceptable to God and to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Father, we give you thanks for your word and uh, this grand, glorious text in your holy scriptures. We are by nature sinful people, so we violate your righteous commandments all our lives. But you have promised pardon and forgiveness if we confess and repent of our sins with our whole hearts. And then we can worship you in spirit and truth with reverence and joy because you have saved us, worship that is acceptable and pleasing in your sight. So we now ask that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may know you truly and obey your word with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Amen.